Hi, my friend Calvin here. Today, I'd like to talk about what a day in a PhD student life look like, because some of my audience asked about it, and I think those who didn't ask may be also interested in hearing about it. I myself got a PhD degree about four years ago. Wow, time really flies. I defended my thesis on March fifteenth, two thousand seventeen, and. Got my PhD degree on May 24th, same year. I still vividly remember these days. My girlfriend is also a PhD student right now, so I think I know what a PhD student life usually look like better than the general population. I did my PhD in neuroscience at UBC. I enrolled into neuroscience master program first and transferred to PhD program after a year without completing the master program. I started the master program in September 2012. Although I started working on my project in the lab from June that year, that was my first time in a country outside my home country, and I was on my own, no friends, no relatives, nothing. I was 2012, and now when I look back, I feel. Like I didn't know what I was really doing, and felt like I was brave, mainly because I didn't know how hard it is to do a PhD. Doing a PhD is hard; it's really hard. But how was I able to do that? I think I was young and kind of didn't know what is hard and what's easy. Why I did my PhD and how one should decide whether he or she should do a PhD or not. I think I'm going to talk about it in the future videos in my channel. So subscribe to my channel if you want to hear about it. Don't forget to click. The like button below. Let's get back to a day in the PhD student life topic. My life during my PhD was not much different from that during my masters. If there was, I was busier during my PhD than during my masters, and was doing a lot of larger projects than during my masters. I would usually get up at 7 a.m. and work out in one of the school's gyms for about 30 minutes. Go back to my dorm, have a shower. And have my breakfast. Sometimes I would directly go to the cafeteria beneath the building where I work, pick up sausage, bread, and a cup of coffee, and go to the lab where I can also have shower. I was usually the one who arrives first and starts experiments. My experiments depend on my projects. Some days I would do cell culture experiments and place cells, and some day I need to do electrophysiology experiments, and some day I need to do imaging. In my cell culture Experiment. I would extract mouse brain, dissociate their tissue into individual floating cells in a media, plate them in dishes like this in a media, put them into incubators, which are 37 degrees Celsius stable water vaporized box filled with 5% carbon dioxide. Within days, these cells, most of which are neurons, would gradually settle down and start growing dendrites and axons, and connect with each other by forming synapses, and talk to each other via chemical signals called neurotransmitters, and started forming networks. Isn't that exciting? That a few million neurons and some good Their cells were in the brain and were taken out, plated in a dish, can form small networks by connecting with each other via synapses, the chemical connections. I would wait for them to grow in the dishes, and after a certain day, I would treat them with drugs, peptides, chemicals, or do patch clamp experiments. If I have an electrophysiology experiment, which is where I would do patch clamp recording, I would start the day by preparing liquid solutions for the experiment. What is a patch clamp recording? For those who don't know, patch clamp recording is one of many electrophysiology techniques mainly used in biology labs. Basically, we use very small, thin glass tubes. We call pipette, filled with solutions whose components mimic that in cell, to suck into cell membrane, which is composed of two layers of lipids. Then I quickly suck again, usually with my mouse, through a rubber tube connected to. The glass pipette and break the cell membranes so that the solution inside the cell is no longer isolated from the solution outside the cell by cell membranes. They are connected. This makes any ion movement inside the cell to be sensed 
and recorded by an electric wire placed inside the glass pipette. The wire is of course connected to an amplifier, which in turn is connected to my computer. What electrophysiology is doing is to basically record changes in cell currency and cell membrane potential. If not all, most live cells have potential difference across the cell membrane. Many cells, especially neurons, glia, and some endocrine cells are excitable. That means they can fire action potential, which is a sudden change in membrane potential from minus 70 milliwatts inside the cell to plus 10 or 20 milliwatts inside the cell compared with extracellular solution and gradually go back to minus 70. It's a cycle that goes on and on. Once this sudden membrane potential change reaches the synapses, which are usually at the tip of their long dendrites. After traveling along those long dendrites, many of the more than 100 different types of proteins located on the synaptic vesicles, where the neurotransmitters are stored, start to change their shapes and structures because they're sensitive to membrane potential changes. This would allow the synaptic vesicles to merge with the presynaptic membrane and release their neurotransmitters. The receptors of these neurotransmitters sitting on the postsynaptic membrane, which is part of another cell, would combine with these neurotransmitters and start to making chemical and electrical changes to this next cell. That's how neurons typically talk to each other. What I do is to record the membrane potential changes, which reflects the abundance of the synaptic connections coming from the neurons sitting around the one that being recorded. Sometimes my day is full of electrophysiology recording in our electrophysiology room, which is a small room full of many items. Sometimes I need to use fluorescent proteins to identify my target neuron among other cells on glass slide. I need to close the window curtain and search for those cells that are giving off weak green light. If no one is around, I would listen to my music or audible books because only a low level of attention is needed when recording these electrophysiology experiments. Once I become familiar with the techniques, otherwise it quickly become quite boring. I finish the Martian this way. I would usually go for lunch around 12.30 to 1 p.m. I usually pick up food from the downstairs of a block called University Village. It's a very international kind of place where you can find all kinds of food, from Indian curry chickens to Mediterranean grilled vegetables, to Japanese sushi, Chinese dishes, and to various ramen. I like most of them. That's right. I did not cook much when I was doing my PhD. That's because first, cooking is not the best use of my time because I was pursuing academic productivity. Second, my cooking skills wasn't as good as it's now. Third, the food in the village wasn't expensive and I could afford them easily. I would grab my lunch and go back to our lunchroom, which is on the same floor as our lab. Eat my lunch there together with my lab members and have some chit chat. After 10 to 15 minutes of lunch break, I would usually go back to my experiments without any breaks. Sometimes I would do two to three big experiments a day. That could be staining cells with uh, fluorescent antibodies while doing electrophysiology and uh, cell culture experiments. That would usually make me very busy. In that case, I would usually be busy from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., even 10 p.m. There were many times I left the lab and went back to home around 12 a.m. But normally I would go home around 10 p.m. I felt like my brain become very slow and prone to make mistakes after 10 p.m. Therefore, I try to avoid doing experiments after 10 p.m. unless the experiment is very simple. I would grab my dinner around 5.30 to 7 p.m. in between experiments and continue to do my experiments and continue to listen to my audibles or music. If I'm doing electrophysiology or taking pictures of immunostain cells, usually most people would leave by 5.30. But I would usually continue to do my experiments, do my data analysis, edit my paper, or edit my figures. Once I finished my experiment, I would spend 10 to 15 minutes cleaning up my experiment stages, make them ready for next users, and go home. I was living on campus, and 
I would arrive home around uh, 9 to 10 p.m. Then I would take a shower, brush my teeth, and go to bed. Next day, same things repeat in the same order. It was the summer. I did a whole bunch of electrophysiology experiments and did not go out the school campus for two months straight. During this period of time, my average work hour a day was about 14 to 15 hours. No weekends, no holidays, nothing. I was doing it voluntarily. No one required me to do that. It was about 100 hours a week. Basically, sleep, eat, research. Sleep, eat, research. Sleep, eat, research. Repeat. No social, no gathering, no party, nothing. But that was just the busiest eight weeks of my entire PhD. Normally, once a month, we would have a uh, PISA talk in the uh, Brain Research Center, which locates within the UBC hospital, and external neuroscience talks on every Friday. I would usually attend them and talk to my peers and learn about their work and lives. My PhD life was not just about experiments and research. It was actually much more colorful than what I've been talking about here. I learned swimming and dancing by taking UBC extracurricular courses. I was actively attending some clubs and even tried some entrepreneurship things, although that wasn't very successful. I met my girlfriend there at UBC and we're currently living in Toronto together. Looking back, it was quite a challenge, physically and mentally, not only because science itself, but also because English is technically my third language and the culture was new to me. Even with those seemingly disadvantages, I was able to publish four first author, four co-author, in total eight papers in peer-reviewed journals within 4.6 years, which is how long my PhD took. That is normally considered very productive in the field. I've seen several 7-year, 8-year PhDs who are native English speakers. So my understanding is that in science, language is very important, but it's not the most decisive skill. I think in my case, besides hardworking and a little bit smart, I was very lucky and things were very smooth. One of my lucks was that my supervisor is very nice and very supportive advisor. She was not hands-on on everything, but she provided all the support she can give. I'm very grateful for having her as my supervisor. She gave enough space for me to make my own decision on my research projects, most of which she actually liked. One of the best things about doing your PhD is that you actively and bravely seek advice and suggestions, as well as help from people as much as you can. But you are the one who makes decisions on your projects with guidance from your supervisor. It's very different from working in a uh, business institution. In one of my future videos, I will talk about advantages and disadvantages of doing PhD. If you're interested, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to click the like button below. That's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, see you next time.